always a really of anything about the craziness of the pandemic it's really nice this wednesday thing is just to consistently see everyone i know i don't get to like be close to you like we were in the center but seriously seeing you each week it's really nice thank you um and then just i'm still kind of on that um what is it interdependent co-arising mm -hmm. idea and how there's so many things like we totally cannot control in terms of what arises interdependently um but one of the things that we do have some agency around is actually showing up on wednesday night um and obviously it's working the contributions that we're making because um that interdependent contribution of time and money is what's helping us to remain here in this space together um, and to help the other people who come together on the different nights remain in their space together i mean not theirs it's our space i just happen to come to wednesday night um and then also you know whatever contributions we can make certainly financially help our teachers continue to inter interdependently co-arise for us um, and us for them because that's a very interdependent co-arising relationship like no teacher no student no student no teacher like it's huge you know the, kind of the reciprocal sort of beauty that happens um, and so that's just all my kind of long-winded and funny way of saying please if you can give generously that will be supporting the center the dharma collective and that will be supporting our teachers and that will be supporting us and um of course it's to whatever your means are you know 50 cents five thousand dollars or more um and anything in between and just thank you for showing up regardless of any monetary contribution so and then I'll just give one announcement about upcoming stuff. So I highly recommend that people check out the calendar. It's packed. There's amazing regular teachers. This is not the only amazing regular night, um, but I think it's the best. No, um, <laughs> there's all sorts of great stuff going on. And um, an offering that's coming up soon, starting September 26th, um, is a six week series um, of cultivating motion, emotional balance. And it's for queer identified folks. And this is many of you have met Tig, who's taught a couple times on Wednesday nights. Tig O'Malley, he's a lovely, gentle, beautiful human being. And so he'll be teaching the queer, like a queer sort of focused cultivating emotional balance class um, that's six weeks. And he's very generous in letting me assist him. So um, tell your friends. And um, there's some really nice, uh, images that Eve made. So if anybody has like queer communities where they can post the imagery, let me know and I can email you the little JPEGs. And that's all our whole announcements. And there's lots of other offerings, so check the calendar. And Katie's putting all sorts of and stuff And that CEV stuff is amazing, I have to say. Like the emotional territory is pretty challenging and it really helps just give perspective and tangible ways to kind of work with it more skillfully so we're the mason pamela show is over now <laughs> it's over now <laughs> hey i i'm digging it <laughs> it's relaxed funny i loved your interdependent poetic uh donna talk it's fun it's it, it's good to make that fun right especially if you have to be the one to give that and it's it's inspiring for all of us, you know, I'm inspired to give and be here with you all and share the space and you're inspired to be here and learn and share the space as well. And, and of course, the uh, without our, our monetary gifts, we can't keep the lights on. So everything is, is very much appreciated. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead and just drop in. We get to meditate here at the beginning, and uh, I will guide us through a, a, a meditation for about a half an hour. So go ahead and make a comfortable position, and uh, I'm going to mute myself to see why my kid is knocking at my door.
So taking some deep breaths into your belly and releasing any kind of hiding tension that might be lurking in the body with the out breath. It's nice to go in with the breath and ask yourself, where am I holding this unconscious tension when I feel the stress of the day or of work or even just the stress of being on the planet? How do I hold myself? What do I, where do I put that? tension and breathe into it and then release and soften allow more space in those nooks and crannies for me I find it in my skull the inner ear the jaw the neck somehow for some reason we tend to like to hold the weight of the world there <laughs> just put it down for a bit at least and feel what it's like or maybe you're holding something in the shoulders or at the the waist or the low back or hips, breathing in and soften with the out breath. We'll spend some time now after we arouse our bodhicitta to practice shamatha. So let's take a moment to arouse a heartfelt motivation for our inner life, our inner practice, as well as our outer practice in the world and with each other to be a bit kinder, a bit more compassionate, more spacious, more sense of ease. more humor. Let's take that internal vow. It's this bodhisattva <clears throat> walks through the world with a sense of open-handed compassion. And I'm sure a bodhisattva has a really great sense of humor too. More soft and open. And there's a mudra I'd like to teach you. I teach it from time to time. You take your hands and your uh, palms together in front of you, like a prayer. But then let the middle fingers stay upright and the rest of the fingers fold across each other. The thumb, thumbs are parallel. And this symbolizes the single-pointed intention to awaken for the benefit of all beings, bodhic bodhicitta. It's a beautiful reminder. But in that way that we move through our life, we always try to recommit to being of benefit, to being kind, to not causing harm. And then releasing the hands and coming home again to the breath and the body. Nourishing yourself with each breath. In a sense, the self donglen could be a simple act of sending the breath to your body through the in breath, sending that gift of nourishment, and then the out breath is a receiving. So you're sending and receiving with yourself. Inhale is ascending the breath into the body, nourishing your tissues, nourishing your soul and your mind. And then the exhale is this offering of release and more space. <clears throat> And let's let the flavor of our shamatha be really relaxed, really soft. Notice if there's any kind of rigor or constriction towards trying to attend to the breath in a mindful way. Just let that kind of melt and soften and 
Let the theme of your shamatha be spaciousness tonight. There's no right and wrong way to meditate. Just let yourself experience that simple quality of being in the moment, being with yourself right now in the breath. Just let yourself be. The body wants to let be. The body wants permission to just be. So offer that to yourself. That's the natural state. This beingness, this quality of contentment and happiness that we seek in the masters, the yogis, have that. And that is the simple wellness, contentment, this capacity to let yourself be, let yourself be. Relaxing the muscles of the face, the jaw. The eyes can be closed or slightly open, gazing at a comfortable angle towards the floor. It's up to you. Feel the breath in the belly. Notice if you're holding the belly at all, or the kidneys, the side body, the back body. And let the belly be. Let it be what it is. Just don't hold it.
inevitably thoughts and impressions, memories, planning will wander into this uh, stage of the mind. And again, letting things be means not to grasp at them, not to reject them, these classical teachings of walking that middle path between grasping and aversion. When you notice you've been bound up in thought, one nice image is to imagine that that feeling of grasping onto the thinking process is like a child grasping onto a little collection of helium balloons. And when you notice that grasping, then release the hand that's grasping those balloons and let them float up into the sky, just floating away, letting the thoughts go. And come back to yourself in this simple moment of breathing. Just enjoying this quality of simply being in the moment with the breath. And now let's practice simply being with the eyes a little open if they've been closed. If you've already had them open, then just stay. It's a little different flavor of just being with whatever visual stimuli you see, any sensory impressions, just like sound and smell and taste and touch. With this vision, we can practice just whatever is seen, let it be seen. Resting in that simplicity of bare attention, free of attachment, free of aversion. And there's that wakefulness there, that quality of wakeful luminosity that's always shining always present. Rest in that space. It's like uh, sitting back more deeply within your being. Leaning back and even relaxing even more into that broader, more lantern quality of awareness. The lantern consciousness has that diffuse, broad awareness rather than the spotlight consciousness that's pointed and directed one thing. Feel that lantern quality, diffuse light. And rest in the vantage point of awareness rather than fused with thought.
and allow the mind to settle in its natural state, free of grasping, free of distraction. Like the autumn leaves drifting down to the ground, let the dust settle and rest in that grounded, open awareness. Just let yourself be here, let yourself be, is another way of saying settling the mind in its natural state, not its habitual state of grasping and hoping and fearing, but in its natural state at ease within itself. And without losing that quality of spaciousness, allow the eyes to close gently, maintaining that quality of space. Really get a sense that the inner space is just as vast as the outer space. In fact, there is no difference between the outer and the inner space. And within this vast space of mind, we can engage in compassion practices to help cultivate these qualities within us and in the world. This quality of flashing on emptiness, this flashing on that open, interdependent brilliance. And I invite you now to feel that breath riding the in and the out breath in and out of the body. The in breath is that courageous act of breathing in, of receiving, of taking in. The out breath is the generous act of offering and sending. The in-breath is the len, the taking. The out-breath is the dong, the sending, the dong len. And I invite you to bring to mind someone. We've always got someone we could focus on, offer our Tonglen practice to, maybe a friend, a loved one, an enemy, a neutral person. Just pick 
Whoever is in most need right now, who calls, is tugging on your heartstrings. And imagine them before you, seeing them like the last time you saw them. Notice what they're wearing. Notice the look on their face. And acknowledge that like you, they wish to be free of suffering, and yet like you, they have areas of pain, of heartbreak, of perhaps illness or hardship of some sort. And whatever that might be for them, however large or small, you could see it like a, a cloud, a dark smoky cloud, and with the in-breath like a vacuum, you draw that suffering in, where it flashes the heart space within you, you transform it and send out a cool healing breeze cool healing light of healing a remedy of whatever ails them so the breath is inhaling drawing in their suffering transforming it at your heart space that bodhicitta heart space and then exhale breathing it out love healing of some sort calming and clearing that smoke around them Practicing with the oh, breath awareness, mindfulness of the breath as you draw in and out. And with each breath, their suffering begins to diminish. They begin to heal. And take your time here. We'll do about 10 to 12 breaths in silence, practicing Tonglen. next few breaths really see them in their full flourishing how would they look and feel they were fully in their power healthy happy radiant May it be so, wish that for them. Make a prayer, may you be well, may you be healthy. Make a personal prayer for them now, out loud or internally.
And now let's pan way out. Now imagine that you pan way out and you are sitting on the moon, looking down at the earth with all its beauty. And yet you also are aware of the suffering. And just like before, you can imagine that the world's suffering. It's like a smoky vapor. And with the in-breath, imagine that you're like a vacuum, drawing it in directly to the heart space. Transform it at that. It's like you're a superhero. Yeah? You're like Wonder Woman or Superman or something, whatever you want to imagine. But you have infinite powers. You breathe it into the heart space and then send out a healing, cool, clear light that brings a resolution of any suffering, violence, illness, disease, pollution, just washed away with the breath. Now for the next few moments, really see our humanity flourishing. See the violence ceasing. Really see the pollution being cleaned up and new resources. Being found to bring more harmony and balance and health for this world. Really like a vision quest, see the world in its full flourishing. How would it feel to you? How would it seem? How would it look? May it be so. From the moon here with your superpowers, make that super strong prayer now, out loud or quietly. A prayer for the earth as if it really, really means something now, because it does. And then release any visualization and just rest with the breath coming home to your body, wherever it's at right now. And soothing yourself into this nice, simple, letting be feeling we'll take with us into our class, into our life, into our sleep. Thank you.
Thank you. You can dedicate the merit and offering it up for the benefit of all everywhere. Okay, so we're coming back now from our planet, from the, from the moon, it's not a planet. <laughs> um, that's a style of Tonglen I learned from Pema Chodron once. It's the only time I've really studied Tonglen with her in person. And, uh, I asked her to give, uh, she was doing just a general Q&A at Tara Mandala for a fundraiser we were having a few summers ago. You know, Pema Chodron is 80 now, or in her early 80s, so she lived nearby in uh, Crestone. It's like a three-hour drive from Taramandala, southwest Colorado. And so we were lucky to get her to come and give some teaching. So she was just fielding questions from the audience, and, you know, I'm... I could take Tonglen to the grave and Lojong, you know, for me, if I had to choose one Dharma practice for a desert island, for me, it would be Lojong. And uh, I was like, I've got to get some teachings on Tonglen from her in person here. This is crazy. You know, people were asking a lot of other things. So I stood up and asked a question. I said, would you, would you guide us in an experience of Tonglen? And so she did, and that's what she taught. She just right away, she put us up on the moon <laughs> and led us just through this whole global Tonglen. It was like going zero to 60, you know, in a second. It was good, though, just simple. It's because when we're venturing in the mind, we can really, we can do anything. So, so I offer that to you in gratitude for my teachers and love. Uh, Pema Chodron, in particular, offered that style. One of her classic books is Start Where You Are. It's one of my favorite old-time Lo Jong books. If you haven't read it, I recommend reading it, Start Where You Are, by Pema Chodron. It's nice to see everybody here. I'm looking now. I'm seeing your faces. Hi, everybody. Yeah, good. You can make your funny faces. That's all right. I can take it. <laughs> good. Hi. Oh, it's good to see you. Maybe we can do a little Q&A here, and then I want to sh share something special tonight with you. We are, our theme of the night is the third point of the Lojong teachings, which is transform uh, all circumstances, good and bad onto the path of enlightenment. This, the point three literally says transform bad circumstances onto the path of enlightenment. <laughs> but actually it's important to transform good experiences as well and everything in between. So here's the third point. There are seven points in the mind training of this particular text that we're doing. Some versions have eight. So we're on point three here today, which is really the, the, the crux of mind training is transforming all joys and sorrows onto the path of enlightenment. And I actually have a song I'm going to teach you tonight about that. It's a Tibetan song that we sing after our Chud practice, this uh, sadhana that, that I've learned at Tara Mandala and other places. And there's a beautiful song that teaches on this very thing. So I want to have time to teach that to you. But any questions or comments about practice, uh, you can raise your hand, unmute yourself, say your name, and then ask your question. Or if you're shy, you can do the chat too, or if you don't want to unmute, doesn't mean you're shy, but you could unmute. I have a question. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. Um, 
So I think what's been bothering me is, you know, I am a practicing Buddhist and I try to take the Dharma with me, like in social circles that aren't Buddhist without, you know, verbalizing that I'm Buddhist and I'm practicing it. And so there's this morning group that I, I zoom with every morning and they talk a lot about samsaric stuff. And as a practitioner, it's just hard for me to kind of just sit and nod my head and, you know, and I just think of like, at what point should I start distancing, distancing myself away from these kind of these social circles that are very kind of, you know, have samsaric tendencies that kind of go against my values. Yeah. So this morning group is not a Dharma group, obviously, it's something yeah. else. And when you say mm-hmm. samsaric, it's kind of like it to you, it feels like more materialistic or more focused on mundane it's, it's, things or yeah it's it's more like um kind of indulging the senses okay yeah drug sex and rock and roll <laughs> i'm kidding something in the morning. <laughs> in the morning. And a lot of you know like poly relationships those kind of things and oh oh yeah that can i don't know about that i haven't been yeah that's so it's true that uh, the sangha is very important, right? And so if we feel like we're not in good company, or if we, it's not even a judgment of good and bad, but if it doesn't feel good for us, right? Or if you, if you feel like your, your suffering meter, your personal suffering is increasing, being around certain people or a certain person, then definitely I would try to... Um, take the right steps and set your boundaries in a way that's appropriate for you. I mean, we're all different and we all have to have different ways of being in the world. But to me, just honestly, Vanessa, hearing you, it sounds like you're, you kind of know what you need to do. And it's just good to, to, to speak that out loud, you know, whether it's the whole group or maybe you can maintain a friendship or two of the people, the core people that you might really like in that group, but not really get involved. Um, you know, it's just making me think of, I used to smoke cigarettes. I was smoking a pack a day. I was an art student, and I thought that was really cool. <laughs> and I couldn't quit. And I lived in a household of other artists and actors and eccentrics, and they were all smoking like chimneys. And I could not stop smoking until I moved out. I had to remove myself from that toxic environment. I got my own place. And then I started meditating and practicing yoga. And it showed me how much I was suffering because of my smoking and other habits. And it helped me from the inside out make the right choices and stop those behaviors that were causing me suffering. But there's sometimes we have to remove ourselves from those environments. Yeah, and when you meditate, you really touch in. You're like, okay, yeah, this doesn't sit well with me. I can't keep poisoning my inner life by being around people that don't um, that don't have the same you know goals or I uh, um, foci, foci you know focuses in their life so definitely I would support you in making that decision yeah I don't know. You know, I feel I feel a little bit like Dr. Ruth right now, too. I have to be careful not to tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> but, yeah, I guess Dharma, a Dharma teacher can also play that role sometimes. Right? Yeah. Good luck with that. I hope I hope you you find a good way to do it in a way that's nourishing for you. OK, so who's next? Dr. Chandra. The Dharma Doc, you have a new column. Hello. Can you Hello. Hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. So, hi. Hi. I've really been enjoying uh, these Wednesday night sessions with you and Eve. Thank you for doing this. Great. Um, so, on Vanessa's, uh, what you were advising her. I'm just curious, when Penma uh, talks about leaning into things, how do, how would that apply to what Vanessa is saying? Because there's something that she's being uh, repulsed by. 
can you kind of explain that? Because that's kind of a thing that I, I've been trying to understand. Mm. Do, you know, do you understand what I'm... Yeah, I would say, yeah. I mean, maybe it's not always clear what we should lean into. Sometimes we should lean into something that at first we don't want to lean into, but eventually it's good for us. And so, yeah, it does take discernment. Discernment's a very important aspect to cultivate. And again, contemplative practices like meditation or study therapy, things like that can help us find where the, the line is for us or what when it's a good pain and when it's a bad pain, you know. And so definitely if a, an environment's feeling toxic or even if it's not that abusive, but it's just not really where we want to put our energy, right? Like if life is short and we want to have a meaningful, fulfilling life, then we don't, really don't want to waste our time with things that aren't really aligned with what we want to do and who we want to be in the world. So I would say it's good to lean out of, of those experiences and don't judge or don't feel like, oh, well, I'm not embracing life fully, you know, or uh, definitely it's important to know when to lean out of certain circumstances. And I guess, you know, as I'm doing that movement, what I'm realizing is when I'm leaning out of something that's not beneficial or he wholesome or positive for me, I'm actually leaning into something else, right? I mean, we're always leaning in some direction. So when you pull out of something, you're pulling into another thing. And there's sometimes we don't even know what that is. And it winds up being better than we could ever imagine. <laughs> and then we could lean into that. So you're here, you're leaning into Dharma practice, you know, and then you're feeling the dichotomy between that and then other things that feel more samsaric. Um, you know, of course, there are certain more advanced practices that's found in Tantra where you lean into um, the transgressive uh, behaviors, but that's for really advanced practitioners. That's not for the faint of heart or for beginners. Um, and I think that in, it's true that, that Tantra can be misconstrued and pe a lot of people can get hurt. The whole, like Tantra, like sex, it's not just about sex, but in our modern time, there's a lot of kind of sex gurus and new versions of Neo-Tantra where it's all about sex. sex. <laughs> but originally Tantra was maybe like just a minor 1% about sexuality. But it was about waking up through the senses. So that can be interesting, but you have to be very grounded. And it has to be grounded in bodhicitta. So Marina and Vanessa, there's my answer. Is it grounded in bodhicitta? Bodhicitta is that, is there benefit there? Is there a, a sense of service and well-being? and Or is it selfish or small-minded? Or does it cause more suffering? Or does it cause liberation? So if you lean out of something, you're leaning into something else. So what is that? Could be fun. Okay, maybe one more. Okay, so this third point of the Lojong, oh, somebody in the chat. I have a friend who sometimes thinks being a door, doormat is bodhicitta-oriented behavior. <laughs> That's a great question, comment. Um, that's so not true. That's a misunderstanding. It's called... Um, idiot compassion, to be quite frank. There's a name for it. So what it is, is the bleeding heart, you know, who's just bleeding out and then doesn't have anything to give. So that's definitely actually a common pitfall, not just in this modern time, but in old times as well. And they say that you need to have compassion, which is a f another way of saying bodhicitta, this compassionate heart to be of benefit to others, balanced with wisdom. So compassion and wisdom are the two wings of the bird to enlightenment. So if the bird only has one wing, it goes in circles. So if you just have compassion without wisdom, without discernment, then it's this idiot compassion. 
So the wisdom is, yes, it's discernment. It's an understanding of ethics. It's also an understanding of your own boundaries and self-worth so that you don't become a doormat. But it's also the wisdom that sees into the true nature of reality. It's a deep wisdom. This shunyata, emptiness, that we see into, meaning the emptiness of subject-object duality. So that there's less likely, when you understand emptiness, when you have wisdom into emptiness, this sherap um, in Tibetan, it helps to mitigate idiot compassion. It's a wisdom that comes through living and, and the years of living too, and experience. So likewise, you can have a stale, stark, cold wisdom. So wisdom also needs compassion to breathe life into it, to balance it. Because they're also, on the other side, there are people who are just all intellect and all about, you know, knowing things, <laughs> or even philosophy, but then where's the heart? So that's also a circular path. In, in the worst sense of the word, like the bird going around in circles. So you need the two wings of the bird of enlightenment, wisdom and compassion. The physical isolation is a consequence of COVID has made most of us crave relationship and some of those relationships may be unhealthy. Yeah, that, that can be true. That can be true, Walt, thank you. Yeah. My 12-year-old son, oh my God, he's stuck with his parents. I mean, could you think of any other hell realm that could be worse for a 12-year-old? So he wants more access to video games, and I'm drawing the line. I'm saying no shooting games, no violent games, just basketball <laughs> and race car driving. And he's pushing back. And so we had a big argument last night at the dinner table. And he finally came out and said, I don't even like you guys. <laughs> I don't even like being around you. And yeah, that hurt. But then I thought, oh my God, if I was him, stuck with my parents for months on end, no friends to run around with, and no new relationships to have, I would be pretty angry too, you know. And I told him, I said, it's okay. I understand. We don't need to be your best friend, you know. We're your parents. We have to draw the line. And you you're not going to like us all the time. So talk about craving relationships. That was a little personal anecdote. I mean, we're all just going nuts on one level. But then the yogis and the meditators are kind of in heaven too, right? You know, I'm, I love this. <laughs> parents it's it's good right differentiation is important so yeah I think then like after he said that and even had some sobs he said I'm so glad we had this conversation <laughs> I think he really needed to get that off his chest and it, to have it be okay was probably uh, really needed so anyway the dharma of parenting I'm a student of that for sure so okay so now I want to share this really fabulous uh, song with you. So I'm going to ask, I think, Katie, is it you who are going to share the screen? So this is a song that literally is called Taking Happiness and Sorrow Onto the Path. So I want to teach on this point three using this song as our basis. Um, pretty small. It might be too small. Is it too small for people? If people are saying thumbs up. It's okay. You can make your screen bigger. There's can I make... options at the very top of the screen. You can make things bigger if you wish. There is also a, a link in the chat. And so if it's too small to see through the screen share, you can click on the link and it'll open uh, in your browser. Great. Okay, good. 
yeah, hopefully everybody's okay. If not, you can maybe chat chat Katie directly, right? Katie, I'm going to make people <laughs> chat to you. No problem. You're the lucky one. Okay, great. Thanks so much. So this is a, a song that was uh, written by a great Tibetan yogi named Pegyal Lingpa. Pegyal Lingpa. P-E-G-Y-A-L. And then the next name is Lingpa, L-I-N-G-P-A. You could look him up. You'll probably find some wonderful pictures. He's a really great yogi. He's one of those those yogis, those kagyu yogis with the long dreadlocks who, you know, never cut their hair and um, were real, real true yogis. And so he wrote this called Taking Happiness and Sorrow Onto the Path. In Tibetan, it's Kiduk Lamkir. Kiduk Lamkir. Ki means happiness. Kipo. Ki means happy. Duk means suffering. Lam means path. And kir means to take. So I'm up at the top line here. Uh, Kiduk Lamkir. Yeah, thank you. I'm doing it realizing, oh, nobody's seeing my cursor. So that is the title of this beautiful song. I'll give a commentary and then we'll actually sing it in Tibetan. And this really gets at the thrust of what the, the heart really gets to the heart of the uh, Lojong teachings. Ho is a common way to start a poem. It's like ho, like it opens the space, ho. If I am happy, I am happy because I dedicate it to the accumulation of merit. May it fill the space of immediate benefit and ultimate happiness. If I am in sorrow, I am happy because I take upon me the sorrow of all. May the samsaric ocean of suffering be emptied. If I am sick, I am happy because I am wearing off the bad karma of many lifetimes. May this suffice for all the sicknesses of sentient beings. If I die, I am happy because I will die in the state of dharmata, which is suchness, or the ultimate truth of reality. Dharmata, suchness. May the root of samsaric birth and death be severed through. If I live longer, I am happy, because through the two accumulations of merit and wisdom, as my footnote. May the twofold benefit of mine and others, of self and other, be spontaneously accomplished. So that is the poem. The rest, the smaller Tibetan font, just talks about who wrote it. It was Pegya Lingpa who wrote it in response to a student asking for teachings. In the great yogi tradition of uh, Shakya Sri, who was a, a great yoga yogi of many centuries ago. So uh, you may have noticed that each line is kind of coupled. So if I'm happy, I'm happy because da da da. The next line is if I'm unhappy, right? If I'm in sorrow, I'm happy because, and then he talks about that. Then the next line is if I'm sick, I'm happy. And then the next one is, well, if I die, I'm happy. And then the last one ends on a positive note. <laughs> if I live longer, I'm happy. So you can see how he's playing with this idea of taking both the joys and the sorrows onto the path and then explaining, giving Dharma teachings through song, explaining why this could be so. So let's look at that. The first line, Ho, oh, if I am happy, I'm happy because I dedicate it to the accumulation of merit. May it fill the space of immediate benefit and ultimate happiness. 
So meaning that when I'm happy, remember this is like um, the four immeasurables. Remember when we were talking about the the Brahma Viharas, the four immeasurables, and one of them is empathetic joy, where we rejoice in the goodness of others and also in our own life for ourselves. There's a quality of rejoicing in the positive circumstances, the happiness that people have, not feeling jealous or competitive. So in the same vein, it's this quality of generosity of heart, right? So if I'm happy, that's so good. You know, I rejoice. I am happy because this joy that I feel, I can dedicate it to others and I can accumulate positive merit or good you know, it's like filling up your gas tank. Positive merit's like filling up your gas tank to enlightenment, <laughs> right? So with merit, it's like momentum, it's energy, positivity. So we dedicate that joy to the accumulation of merit, of good energy. And then we offer it. May it fill the space of immediate benefit and ultimate happiness. So may it fill space, may it benefit others immediately, and then ultimately, may it bring to ultimate benefit, ultimate happiness, I mean. And what do you think ultimate happiness is? What is the ultimate happiness, the ultimate gift, experience? Awakening. It's enlightenment. From a Buddhist perspective, it's... It's Buddhahood. So we're dedicating it for that fruition. On the other hand, then the next line, the second line, if I'm in sorrow, I'm also happy. Why? And we don't ta we're not talking about like happy face, squeaky, you know, shiny, happy. We're talking about like content, fulfilled, grounded, that kind of happy, right? So if I'm in sorrow, I'm also happy. Why? Because I take upon me the sorrow of all. May the samsaric ocean of suffering be emptied. This is so Lojong and so Tonglen, right? Where the Bodhisattva has the courage to, if not in actuality, yet in prayer, be willing to breathe in, to take on the suffering of others, transform it, and send out healing. And this kind of ideal is found not just in Buddhism, it's found in Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you know, this, this quality of charity, of service to others as a true path. And so if I'm in sorrow, I am happy because you can actually, like when you're suffering, you can imagine it's not just you suffering alone, that actually your suffering is, yes, it's a way of purifying. Perhaps you're purifying some certain old karmas are coming to fruition and you're burning them off. That's definitely the way that Buddhists think of illness, by the way. It's like a purification. So if you're sick, be happy. You get to purify. It could have been a lot worse. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting way to think of it, isn't it? Like I remember when I was living in Dharamsala, North India, in the Tibetan refugee settlement back in 96, um, I remember I bumped my head. I was teaching, I think I was at a nunnery where I was teaching English and I was getting up and I bumped my head on a cabinet or something and one of the nuns said, oh, very good, very good. <laughs> I was like, no, that hurt. And she said, no, no, it's good. When you bump your head, it means you're purifying a lot of very serious karma. <laughs> you know, because the head is our most cherished part of the body. Yeah, for good reason. And uh, and by if you bump it or hit it, you know that that could have been a lot worse, right? It could have been a heavy blow. And it was the bump, purify that. So it's that that's attitude of illness being a purifying moment, and so we can actually turn the tables on our normal way of considering our hardship and our illness, and recognize that we are. Um, but when I'm in sorrow or when I'm suffering. I can be happy because I can feel that I'm actually purifying and I'm taking on the sorrow and suffering of all beings. And I'm purifying all of that through my illness, through my sorrow, through my pain, through my heartbreak. May all samsaric, may the samsaric ocean of suffering be emptied so that 
means through my suffering may I help to empty this ocean, ocean of samsara. Then the next line, if I'm sick, I am happy. Oh, here I'm talking about illness. I was talking about illness too soon, but we can apply that now. If I'm sick, I'm happy because I'm wearing off the bad karma of many lifetimes. <laughs> May this suffice for all the sicknesses of sentient beings. So may my sickness suffice for others' illness as well. This may feel foreign and like too gutsy or too much to ask of you. And if so, that's fine, you know. Engage with this according to your own capacity. But this song, whenever I sing this, it lands in me deeper and deeper. And I'm always like, can I go there? It's an invitation to stretch into that possibility. Because in the next line, if I die, I am happy. Wow, that's quite a statement. Why? Because I will die in the state of dharmata. That's an aspiration. May I die in that quality, that natural state of mind, which is true bliss and total liberation. It's like when I die, in a way it's true that when we die, we're free of this old body with all of its aches and pains. It's not to say we want to bring about that moment prematurely, but that moment of death can be a very great liberation. So if I die, I'm happy because I will die in the state of dharmata. I will come home to God or to bliss or to absolute consciousness or my own true nature, however you feel it and intuitively understand that what happens at death. I think many people will say with near-death experiences, spiritual traditions will say it's very blissful. It's that dharmata, that suchness. May the root of samsaric birth and death be severed through. So this, this is a very common image, is that, that when you're trying to, you know, cut down the, 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 the weed or the tree of suffering, Rather than severing a bunch of little branches or leaves from the top down, you can do one decisive cut, sever at the root, the source of suffering, which is ego fixation and clinging. And so what we're saying here in this prayer, when I die, and if I let go into that state of suchness, then the root of the cycle of suffering, that clinging that brings us back again and again and again through habitual patterns of craving, May it be cut through. May it be severed through. And may I be liberated. Then the last one, if I live longer, I am happy because through the two accumulations, may the twofold benefit of mine and others be spontaneously accomplished. So what that means is if I live longer, if I can do lot more Dharma practice, more charity, more benefit, more learning, then I'm happy also. Because through the two accumulations, and it doesn't say here, but that the two accumulations are the Tsokni. Remember we learned that Tsokni Rinpoche, his name literally means the two accumulations. This is this classic Dharma word. The two accumulations, the Tsokni. You see it here. Uh, maybe Katie can scroll. It's a, Tibetan is Mitse Ringna Gate Tsok. Yeah, and Tsok is right there in the middle of that line. Tsok. Ni, yeah, tsok ni ki is of so tsok ni means the two accumulations, and that is of merit. So the accumulations of merit, meaning positive karma, positive energy, through good deeds, through being of benefit in the world, and then the other tsok is the accumulation of wisdom. So accumulating wisdom through study, practice, life, living brings wisdom. So through those two accumulations, may the twofold benefit, which means the twofold benefit of self and other. They say here, mine and others. So may the twofold benefit of mine and others be spontaneously accomplished, meaning may it arise naturally. Lungi uh, drupar show is the last line there. Lun, lun is the spontaneous. Gidrup means arising, accomplishment. 
May it be so. Parsho, du parsho. May I accomplish this spontaneously. So that is the meaning of this beautiful poem. It's something you can read and meditate on. It is something you can um, sing. If you like, I will teach you the melody now. So, uh, and this is recorded, so you can come back to it again and again. You can know, oh, the last 15 minutes of Wednesday night's class has the melody. I can listen to it again and again and learn it, memorize it. And this is meant to be a devotional contemplative melody, a song to contemplate. So hopefully you can see the Tibetan, because we will sing in Tibetan. It's a little small for me, but uh, it's good enough. Uh, you can make it bigger, as Katie said. And just follow along. We'll go slow. Oh, wow, that's really good. Thank you. Okay, that's better. Mm -hmm. So... Let's take a couple breaths. <clears throat> and follow along with me. Oh, It just goes the same. Every line is the same now. Dukna gate kungi dukna kur dukna. Yam to tong basho. Third line. Na na gate.
So that is the melody. We did it a little slower than you would normally do it for learning purposes. But in doing it slow, you can also kind of toggle with your eyes down to the English so you can remember what you're singing. The beautiful structure of the song is like the first two words is like if I'm happy. So ki is happy, na is if. So if I'm happy, gate means then I'm happy actually. It means then I'm joyful. And then it goes on and on. I don't need to give the word for word translation, but the second line, same thing. Duk na, duk means suffering or sorrow. Na means if. So if I have sorrow, Gate, I'm happy. Therefore, I'm happy. So it's that structure. If this, then that. The third line, same thing. Na, na, because na means sick. Na means if. This should be spelled differently. Na, na, if I'm sick, gate, then I'm happy, therefore. And the next line below is shina, which means if I'm die. Gate, then I'm happy. Last line, mitse ringna. So mitse ring means long life. If you have no, uh, if you know Tibetans or have been in the Tibetan community, tsering is a Tibetan name. It means long life. <laughs> it's a good name, huh? So mitse ring. If I have a long life, gate, I'm happy. So it's like that. The structure is very beautiful if you know the language too. Uh, but even the sound, the, the blessings come through the sound. This ancient song. So um, any questions about that? This is really the, the crux. Like I said, it's the heart of Lo Chong. So I thought it'd be good to to give you a different angle into it and give you this gift of a, of a song and devotion and prayer. Yeah, I hope it touched you. Maybe we could ask some questions, and if you want, we could sing it again a little quicker. My voice is super hoarse right now. I've been talking a lot today, so I had a little challenge, but thanks, Walt. I appreciate your kindness. Anybody has any questions? Why don't you chat? We could chat it in, chat in a question or two. Did you like it? Um, yeah, it, yeah, Tibetan is a very melodic uh, spoken language, and it's not always easy for Westerners to learn because it's a pretty, uh, it's tonal, like Chinese is, and transliterations are often a bit clunky because the Tibetan way of spelling is a little um, different than what we're used to. Okay, Mace liked it. Uh, beautiful, moving. Thank you, Lily and uh, Tanya. Okay. Would you like to sing it again? A little faster? Not. It, it's not fast. It's never sung fast, but we'll speed it up just a little bit. Good. Okay. Let's see some thumbs up. Okay. So... It's, it's definitely melancholy. <laughs> And I, I don't know, I think singing right now in this time, I find a lot of refuge in singing and the arts, of course, creative expression, but there's something, the heart, the heart gets to uh, open a bit when we sing. Okay, let's take a deep breath. Kiduk Lamkir, taking happiness and sorrow onto the path. Yam so don't buy. 
Parashu Nana Gate Zera Blingen Zeluchen Kungi Nago You can take this with you and make it your own. Study it, read it, and meditate on it even. Use it as like a contemplative support. And um, this is Lo Zhong, in a nutshell. This is Lo Zhong. And really all dharma is Lo Zhong. Lo means mind or intellect. Zhong means to purify or to train. And so all of dharma practice, whether it's vipassana, zen, you know, studying the Four Noble Truths or Madhyamaka philosophy, you know, no matter what it is, it's all training the mind, training the mind so that we can experience less uh, hardship and more joy or we can transform all the joys and sorrows onto the path of awakening, that we don't waste our precious life and we don't get stuck in the blame game, right? Because when we're angry at the world or we're blaming people in the world and we're not transforming the hardship onto the path. So this is about maturity also in your practice. Maturity. And taking responsibility for your own life. Yeah. So for me, this, this, this poem, this song is a challenging one. I'm not claiming to be able to... Uh, own everything that's said in there, but it, I, I enjoy stretching into that possibility, and I hope you do too. So thank you everybody. Let's take a moment and dedicate the merit for the benefit of all. Any goodness that came from our singing and our prayers and our questions and our meditation bring benefit for you and those you come into contact with in the whole world. We really need these teachings now. I, I really believe that. So may you bring these teachings into your life too and benefit others. Thank you. Emaho, how wonderful. And I uh, thank you for uh, sticking around for this out of the ordinary Wednesday night class. <laughs> Let's all unmute huh, and say goodbye. Thank, thank you, Shanda. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Lovely, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Great midnight lullaby. Yeah, there you go. You can East Coast is good to go to bed you. now. <laughs> Thank you so much.